from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. During our first half hour today, we'll welcome in the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, John Floros, as he offers his annual review of the college's activities and achievements in agricultural teaching, research, and extension. And he'll look ahead to the opportunities and challenges for the college in 2018, discussing, among other things, the areas of research that K-State continues to lead on a national and international level, and the great success that the college continues to have in career placement of graduates. Further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee talks about the nutritional needs of bobwhite quail during rough winter weather and what you landowners can do to promote their survival. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. As we ease our way very steadily now toward the end of 2017, we we take an opportunity to visit at year's end with the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, who also is the Director of Agricultural Research and the Extension Service here at Kansas State in that capacity as well. John Floros is with us once again, and it's a year in review, if you will, on the state of the college in 2017. Maybe take a peek to what lies ahead for the college in 2018 as well. So, John, thank you for coming over, first of all. Thanks for having me, Eric. How would you characterize 2017 then? There were ups and downs. That would be the basis of it? Definitely ups and downs. Uh, I would say more ups than downs. Obviously, one of the downs has been our budget and the budget situation for the uh, university in general. Everybody probably by now knows that the university uh, just experienced a third consecutive student decline. And because of that, the university had to recall back an amount of money from all its units, including our college and KSRE. So for us, uh, we had a budget cut of 2.5% back in June, if you remember, and then another one, f- 5%. Uh, we just, we're still going through that right now. So by the time you put it together, uh, that means that within six months, we've had a 7.5% cut. Very, very significant cut for, uh, for our budget. But if this continues, uh, most likely we will have to to become much smaller in terms of faculty and staff in order to accommodate that, that kind of a cut. Not there yet, but not potentially there yet. on the brink of that. That's right. Not there yet, but uh, we're starting to think about a hiring freeze coming next year in, in anticipation of what's going to happen this, this next year. If student numbers go up, then I think we'll be in good shape. If state budget looks good and we don't have a cut there, then I think we're going to be okay. If neither one of those things happen, if we have a state cut or uh, student numbers continue to go down, uh, we're going to be in trouble. All the units have had to pay back some of the money. Some of the units more than others, uh, simply because of, you know, some of them may have had positions that they could have capitalized on. Some of them may have had fees or grants or contracts or any kind of, of income that has come in. They could have used the money for that. But overall, uh, it has been a significant impact across the college and across KSRE. That's the downside. We wanted to get it out of the way right out the chute because there are many positive stories to tell about the College of Agriculture in 2017. And one is enrollment has held up in the face of a trend we see not only at K-State but other universities in this state, a trend of downward enrollment. Correct. For 12 years within the college, we've increased year in and year out our student numbers, both at the undergraduate level and, in some respects, the graduate level. And that has continued over the last five, six years, with the exception of the last couple of years. What we're seeing now is we're not continuing to grow anymore, but we're not dropping either. Uh, we're holding at what, what I would call a level playing field, Although we're graduating 
record numbers of students, both last year and this year, uh, we continue to bring in enough students so that our numbers don't drop. The university's numbers have dropped significantly, but for the college, our numbers have not dropped. What that tells me is, number one, most likely we have reached capacity in some of our programs, some of our larger programs, either because we don't have enough faculty to continue to teach more classes or, in many cases, because we don't have enough space to really put those students in. And in other units where we can accept more kids and we can train more kids and we're looking and we're trying to get more kids, we haven't been as as good in, in really bringing as many students in as, as we can. But student placement into quality jobs out there after leaving K-State, that is surely a supportive prospect for bringing more students in because the, the success stories are so abundant out there. Absolutely. And, and, and we have example after example that tells us that every student that comes through the College of Agriculture and makes it out, regardless of what the program is, they will find a well-paying job, most likely before they graduate. They will have signed in the dotted line. Some of them within a month or two after graduation. 98% of our students find a job within two months of graduation, December or May. The rest, 2%, 1%, 3%, depending on the year, uh, it's probably because they're not looking for a job or because they're not looking for a job in a broader geographic area. They want to find something near close to home. But that's the good part of, of we train our students well. We provide them with a lot of experiences that are hands-on. We provide them with experiences that really give them real-world understanding of what it is that people are expecting of them once they go out from summer jobs to study abroad programs to internships with a lot of different private companies out there. So by the time they graduate, not only they have the jobs, but they also have a really good understanding of what they need to do to be successful in their job. So I think kudos to our faculty and, and to our staff for really preparing those students well to face reality and to face that world. And this is across all disciplines, it really is, which is equally important here. Correct. Uh, we actually have areas of study programs, undergraduate programs, where we could easily place two or three or five times as many kids as we have, but we don't find enough to come into our programs. Mm -hmm. That is a subtle pitch for the opportunities that uh, the College of Agriculture presents in an educational sense. The research side in 2017, what jumps out to you as hallmarks of that research agriculturally at K-State? Well, a lot of things. I mean, we, we are doing many very, very impactful work in many areas of agriculture and food research. You can broaden the, the scope and talk about crops, and you can talk about animals and animal-related agriculture. You can talk about water. You can talk about food. You can talk about all kinds of, of things. The bottom line is we have focused our areas of, of research in really things that are important to Kansas. We're working very closely to find solutions to the major issues, the major challenges that are facing our state in some cases, the country and the world, but primarily we're concentrating to solve problems that are very pertinent to the state of Kansas. Take as an example water. You know, we're working on more efficient irrigation techniques and we're making progress. We're working or more efficient planting systems. We're working on different types of varieties that use less water or they're more drought resistant. Uh, we're working on varieties that are disease resistance as well as providing more yield. There's all sorts of things that we do from a crop perspective and an agronomic approach perspective to resolve water issues for, for Kansas. And it's interesting because some of the things that we do, they may seem at the beginning to be irrelevant to the state of Kansas. For example, we have a very large international program, but much of what we do internationally comes always back right here at home. As an example, we do a lot of work internationally for sorghum. You know, we have the Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab. Mm -hmm. Well, much of the work that the Sorghum Lab is doing is designed to help developing countries in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and Latin America. But the work we do in, in Africa, for example, is very pertinent to what happens right here in Kansas. 
because the conditions in Ethiopia right now are very dry and very hot, something that we face here at home on a regular basis, and we will face more and more of that as we move into the future. So the results we're finding in Ethiopia on sorghum, we can bring them back and improve sorghum right here at home. Those are just a couple of the multiple examples of the research we see out of the College of Agriculture at K-State. One of the enthusing parts of this, John, and we've had many of these people cross our microphones on this broadcast, but there's quite a a collection, if not uh, an army, of young researchers within the College of Agriculture right now who, who are bringing ideas and energy to the scene. And that is reassuring for the future, isn't it? Absolutely. Starting about six years ago, we started to hire a lot of people. Those people are now getting to the point where not only they understand the system, not only they understand what's expected of them, not only they know what the, they need to do, but they're actually doing it. They're submitting proposals, they're formulating ideas, they're working with other collaborators from within our college or within the university or beyond the university, some of them national collaborations, some of them international collaborations, and they're actually competing more and more to bring in the resources they need to conduct their programs. And what we're starting to see is really the results of many of those younger and mid-career faculty that are now starting to to have their impact. And they are hitting their stride right now. That's exciting, frankly. Exactly. You know, my expectation is that the college will continue to grow in terms of research for, for generations to come because we have hired some very, very good young faculty. And those young faculty... When you put it together with some of the really, really high-quality faculty we had here before, and they provide the mentoring, they provide the guidance, they're providing you know, the coaching, it's a really uh, a key to success, I think. Our guest on this first half of Agriculture Today, the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, John Floros, will return with John after this break. This is the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. We're in the midst of a discussion of the state of the College of Agriculture at K-State, looking back over 2017 and looking ahead here shortly to 2018. Once more with us is the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, John Floros. John, so far we've talked teaching, we've talked research. Let's look at the other leg of that, what's called the three-legged stool that makes up the College of Agriculture, and that being extension out of K-State. When compared to peer extension services around the nation, some would suggest that extension here in Kansas is comparatively healthy at present. Your thoughts? Well, as healthy as we can be under the current budget situation, just like all the other parts of of KSRE and the college, Extension 2 had to pay their dues in terms of uh, budget cuts. But again, when I look at who we are and what we do and why and the impact we're having across the state, uh, the impact we're having in terms of agriculture, the impact we're having in terms of the food system, the impact we're having in terms of water and natural resources, the impact we're having in terms of families, uh, individuals, youth, communities, there's no question in my mind that as an extension system, we are in a position not only to help people help themselves, but also to really drive a change throughout the state that will really, generations from now, people will look back and say, I am so glad that extension was here to help us move to that that position. Now, with the budgets as they are, we have been a lot more proactive in trying to get different resources to come into extension. 
The local governments are stepping up and they're doing their fair share. Our staff, our educators, our agents, our faculty are all have stepped up to the plate and they're competing for grants. They're bringing in the money to support their programs. Uh, they are going to foundations. They're going to federal agencies. They're going to all sorts of places to really find the money that they need to, to carry out their programs. And again, just like our research and teaching components that we talked about before, our extension faculty and extension educators, they are having tremendous success as well. Mm -hmm. So when I look at it, there's no question in my mind that, you know, we do have an extension system that's very active, very beneficial, very impactful to the state today. Can we improve it? Absolutely. A few months ago, we hired uh, a, a new associate director for extension. Uh, Daryl decided to uh, become a retiree, as, <laughs> as he says. Right. And now Greg Hudley is our new extension director. Uh, Greg has been going around the state, and he has had several listening sessions with a lot of different groups. At some point next year, uh, he's going to sit down with with his leadership team, and and we're going to sit down together, and we're going to figure out, you know, what are all these listening sessions about? What have they told us? What are some of the key points? And we're going to start really looking into the future and how we're going to approach the future of extension here in Kansas. And as a program note, later on this week, we'll have Greg Hadley on to talk more about what he found out on those recent listening sessions and his intentions for the service as we move into 2018. And let's talk about the next year, if we might, John, to round out our visit. You do cite at least two or three what you would consider priorities as we get into this new year. What would those be? Well, there is no question in my mind that one of our continuing priorities needs to be infrastructure. As I mentioned before, uh, we have units right now within the college and within KSRE that cannot continue to compete for new money to come in, research-wise or otherwise, because they don't have the space to put new technicians, new graduate students, new postdocs, new researchers to do the work that they need to do. So we're very limited in terms of space. And, and where we're not limited in, in terms of space the quality of that space is not what we need for a 21st century science and technology enterprise. So we need to figure out a way how to improve our infrastructure. We've had the, the, the plan for quite some time now, but we haven't really gained any traction within the university and a lot less outside the university. Well, for the first time in many years, our new president is very, very supportive and is, is, he's becoming very vocal. So over the next year or two, we will continue to push that as a priority for the college. Hopefully, it will become a priority for the university, and hopefully, maybe a couple of years from now, we will have some action taking place at the uh, legislative uh, level so that if the state comes in with some money, then I think we can start moving down uh, this path. We can raise the rest of the money. We might have some federal funds coming in as well. But that's a priority definitely for, for us, and it needs to be because our infrastructure has been left alone mm -hmm. for a long, long time, and we haven't really kept up even with maintenance. So, and you would welcome all inquiries about what the needs truly are from out in the countryside and otherwise. Absolutely. We have needs all across the border. It's not just for research. We have needs for extension. We have needs for teaching. We have needs for educational activities. We have needs across the board. So when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about all of our infrastructure. We have a plan to start with one new building and renovate several older facilities. That new building, it's the name we have coined. It's FASTER, which means food and agricultural systems, teaching, extension, and research. That, that's what makes up faster. <laughs> and I'm saying this because there's a, there's a misconception out, uh, I think, that I've heard back coming to me that this is only going to be about research. No, it's not. It's going to be about teaching, extension, and research, all three of them together. There was a recent ranking out uh, that depicted where K-State is in the pecking order, if you will, as far as land-grant universities, and particularly, in this case, the colleges of agriculture around the nation. There are a number of these rankings out there, and you can pick and choose, but noting that this one does have K-State for sure ranked in the top five in the country, and that's a source of pride, one would think. Oh, absolutely. But that's what happens when you have one of the largest and best 
teaching programs in agriculture in the country. That's what happens when you have one of the biggest and best research programs in agriculture in the country. That's what happens when you have one of the best and, and biggest extension programs in the country. When you put it all together, and that's what this company is called, Niche, that's what they did. They, they pulled all that together and they gave an overall ranking for agricultural programs in all universities across the country. And, and we came in as number four in the country. So when you're being put in the same category as Cornell and Iowa State and ahead of universities such as Texas A&M and Davis and a bunch of others, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good about where we are and what our people have achieved. And I think our stakeholders should feel very good about that too because what that means to them is that they're getting a first-rate service and we're trying to solve their issues and their problems in a good way. I think one of the reasons that things have improved within the college and KSRE is also because of the support we're getting from a lot of people out there, from companies, from individuals, from stakeholders, from legislators. A lot of people have coalesced around the College of Agriculture and KSRE. And, and a good evidence of that is the fact that last year we've raised more than $20 million from donations from a whole different slew of sources. $20 million compared to the 3 to $4 million we were raising five, six, seven years ago, that's a big difference. Yeah. Now, we did have one very large gift this last year, nearly $8 million or so, that really brought us to that level. But nevertheless, when you look at the average for the last five years, we're raising about 13 plus million dollars per year, which is much higher than what we were doing before. Every dollar that we raise goes towards support of our students through scholarships or other experiences that they have, supporting our faculty through faculty chairs, research-related support, extension-related support, as well as our infrastructure. You know, we're putting a lot of money into improving our infrastructure. And if, if the goal of, of really improving our infrastructure in the, in the future goes through as planned, we will have to raise a lot more money for that infrastructure. So it feels really good to be able to say we've raised more than $20 million. For a college like ours, I think that's a tremendous achievement. It's testimony to the belief out there in this college and what it's accomplished, what it will accomplish in the future. We're looking forward to 2018, John, the challenges and the opportunities alike. And so it ought to be a fun ride. I'm looking forward to 2018 as well. It's going to come with some challenges, that's for sure. But I think we're up for it. And I'm looking forward to continue to work with our faculty, our staff, and, and really to work with our stakeholders out there because they are really the ones that have really kept this college going. So with that, I want to wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and uh, I hope everybody gets some time to, uh, to rest a little bit over the break. You bet. And Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you and yours as well. John, thank you for availing yourself for a few moments right here. Thanks for having me, Eric. That's our annual year-end review of the activities and achievements of the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University, teaching, research, and extension. The dean of the college, John Floros, our guest here on this part of agriculture today. More after this break over the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here as we continue on now with today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, farm leaders have praised Senators John Hoven of North Dakota and John Thune of South Dakota for writing an amendment in that final tax bill to address the elimination of Section 199, which allowed cooperatives to pass a deduction for production and marketing expenses onto their members. The Hoven Thune Amendment for farmer cooperatives was added to the conference report of the tax bill that Republicans released late Friday. Hoven said that he and other farm state senators worked to ensure the final tax bill treated cooperatives fairly. National Milk Producers Federation President Jim Mulhern noted that the final bill still repeals the Domestic Production Activities Deduction, as it's called, but he said the legislation does allow cooperative members to claim a new 20% deduction on payments from a farmer cooperative. This favorable treatment for gross income, he says, will help minimize any potential increase in the tax burden on farmer-owned cooperatives. The National Council of Farmer Cooperatives President and CEO Chuck Connor praised Hoven, saying the senator recognized early on that the elimination of that Section 199 deduction threatened to raise the tax burden of many producers and cooperatives. The president and CEO of CHS Incorporated, Jay DeBurton, said the loss of the one Section 199 would have had significant impacts beyond agriculture in rural communities. And the president and CEO of Land O'Lakes, Chris Polosinski, said that the provisions included in the final package will offset the loss of the deduction and help encourage job creation and growth across rural America. Four governors meeting with Vice President Mike Pence pushed the importance of the U.S. remaining in the North American Free Trade Agreement as negotiations to modernize NAFTA continue. Republican Governors Kim Reynolds of Iowa, Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, Bill Haslam of Tennessee, and Rick Snyder of Michigan underscored the trade deal is key to several sectors, including automobiles and agriculture, and the need for the U.S. to remain internationally competitive. They warned of the negative impacts if the pact failed and falls by the wayside with Hutchinson warning of serious harm to agriculture, retail, and manufacturing sectors in his state. They labeled the situation an ongoing discussion. The sessions came as technical level discussions took place in Washington on several fronts with hopes of getting progress in non-controversial areas, though it's not clear yet whether that goal has yet been realized. Nearly all of the farms in the United States are family farms, but the larger scale farms make up a larger share of overall production, according to new USDA data. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA's Economic Research Service has issued a report called America's Diverse Family Farms 2017 Edition. Farming is still basically a family business in the United States. Uh, About 99% of the farms are family farms, and they account for about 90% of the production. ERS agricultural economist Robert Hoppe authored the report. Small family farms, those with gross cash farm income or revenue less than $350,000, make up 90% of farms. They operate about half of the farmland, but they only account for about a quarter of production. At the same time, the larger the scale of the family farm, the larger the share of overall farm production. About 45% of production occurs on large-scale farms. They're still family-operated, but they have revenues greater than a million dollars. What are two things he says small-scale farms produce a high percentage of? Poultry and hay. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Time now for the weekly feature for dairy producers, milk lines. Standing by is K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to talk with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning their feed costs as they move forward in the next six months. You know, now is probably a great time to sit down with your nutritionist and a cup of coffee and try to determine where you might be headed for the next six months in terms of feed costs. You know, harvest here in the United States is pretty much finished. We know a whole lot about uh, what we're going to have available as far as what's in storage and stocks. So prices, barring some great change in exports or some other, 
natural disaster probably won't change very much in the next six months. So now it's really a good time for you to have that conversation with a nutritionist as to maybe how's the cheapest way to feed my cows in the next six months and still maintain level of milk production that I expect from my cows. So some of the things you might want to pay particular attention to is figure out what your cost of your corn silage might be or other forages that you have raised this summer and the amounts of those forages that you have in inventory. Take a look at the number of cows that you're currently feeding and plan to feed over the next six months and let's kind of distribute those forages out. Those may be the cheapest feeds on the farm and the way for you to increase your level of margin over the next six months if you feed more of those feeds and less of purchase feeds. Now some other things to think about as you do this. As you look at purchase feeds, we do feed a lot of co-products or byproducts on our dairies. Some of those come in at a better price for us than others. For example, got a call recently about canola meal. If you're in the upper Midwest, canola meal is generally running a little bit cheaper per unit of protein than soybean meal. However, here in the state of Kansas, at least here in central Kansas, that's not necessarily the case because of transportation. Obviously, we produce soybean meal right here in central Kansas, where canola meal has to be hauled in from a further distance away. Because of that, there's a difference in transportation costs, and it's not probably quite as economical of a buy for us here in Kansas as what it might be elsewhere in the United States. So keep in mind, with byproducts, you have regional differences. You need to take those into consideration. So so what are some positive things we might think about here in Kansas? Well, one of the things you might look at are things like wheat middlings or wheat byproducts as they are readily available here in Kansas. Those might price into your rations very well. In general, many of the corn byproducts still price into diets fairly well. Distillers, grains, corn, gluten, feed might be a couple to consider. So again, you need to sit down with your nutritionist and figure out how that works. Another one to think about, if you're not feeding whole cotton seed, you might want to have a visit about that and determine what it might cost to have it on your farm. I know for several years we didn't see a lot of whole cotton seed on dairy farms because of cost, but it is moderated and maybe would price into your rations. But again, that's a decision that you need to have a discussion with your nutritionist to determine how that might work in your diets, considering some of the other fats that you might be feeding as well. So this is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to sit down with their nutritionist and determine what might be the cheapest way and most cost-effective way to feed our cows in the next six months. All right, Mike, thank you. And we'll be back after this. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research... While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today is back now as we visit once more about another aspect of wildlife management. Charlie Lee, across the way once again, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. It's been tracked very closely in recent years, the recovery of quail populations in Kansas, Charlie. And that leads us to think about quail and what it takes for them to survive the winter. Well, weather is certainly a very important factor in determining quail numbers. We get severe winter storms, and that can potentially decimate quail populations uh, in just a night or two. We occasionally have cold, wet springs that can be equally devastating on newborn chicks that haven't yet developed the ability to regulate their body temperature. So the direct effects of weather are are very obvious. Weather can certainly play an important role, particularly on the northern periphery of the range of northern bobwhite quail. When we're at the extreme edges of those ranges, uh, severe weather storms play a larger role. A recent study Uh, looked at that relationship between northern bobwhite quail population dynamics and weather 
and determined that, yes, um, they could certainly see population reductions for up to five years following extreme snow accumulations on many of the breeding bird survey routes in the northern Bob White Range. So if you're on the edge of the where the population exists anyway, then the impacts of extreme weather events are more important. As we move into severe weather or the potential for severe weather this winter, I think we need to remind ourselves that quail require a lot of energy in order to survive these sub-zero temperatures. We haven't had them yet. That means that more than likely it's going to occur. And they can get through those extreme weather events as long as there's enough food available and that that food is easily accessible. And when that occurs, then you usually have little trouble withstanding those cold weather conditions. So then what food resources provide the energy necessary for quail to endure harsh winter weather? Well, I think it's important that we ask ourselves um, not just what the temperature is, but what is the wind chill. A two-degree Fahrenheit night with a moderate wind of about 11 miles per hour, that's a wind chill factor of minus 25 degrees. So that's pretty significant when we're talking about a small bird the size of, of quail. When it's 68 degrees Fahrenheit out there, a quail is going to need about 30 kilocalories a day in order to survive. That equates to about 350 milo or sorghum seeds. If it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, that wild Bob White now needs about 50 kilocalories a day or almost double 550 milo seeds. The quail have to have that to provide the body fat, so that provides the energy that keeps that body running during extreme cold conditions. With enough fat, quail or other birds can survive for short periods that they may need to fast when we have those other seeds unavailable due to extreme uh, depths of snow or ice. So basically, the fatter they are, the better they can withstand those extreme winter storms. Now, you mentioned milo seed as a source of nutrition here. Is that the primary source found out there? Well, there's certainly a lot of food items out there for quail to choose. Food choice amongst quail have been looked at numerous times. And one old study that was done in Georgia tested 53 different crop seeds. The most preferred was milo. That was rated number one in 94% of over 600 trials that they looked at on food choice. And Milo was number two in the other 6%. Wheat ranks up there close. Uh, cracked corn was number 15 on the list. Uh, sunflower was down at number 39. But we also, the value of those seeds to quail during the winter depends not only on the energy that it provides, but also that size. For instance, if a quail is feeding on sorghum seeds or milo and needs that 60 kilocalories to survive when it's down below 32 degrees, that's 666 seeds that it's going to have to consume. That's one seed uh, every 54 seconds for 10 hours a day. Hmm. So that quail has to be pretty industrious to find that many seeds and and eat them just to maintain that body condition for that particular day. But if they were able to consume corn, and sometimes the corn seeds are small enough or if they're cracked, they need 41 seeds. So you don't need to do as much picking on a larger seed that has a higher percent of metabolizable energy. For wheat, it's about the same. You need 648 seeds to meet that 60 kilocalories. For soybeans, only need 103 seeds. Also was determined that when it's available, insects make the best bobwhite food out there. Crickets, 139 kilocalories per ounce, which is 30% more kilocalories per ounce than corn, which is very high in metabolizable energy. So if you have conditions where seeds are not available, insects are unlikely to be uh, available as well. So the quail are going to have to keep that thermal energy needs met by utilizing body fat, which is put on at other times. 
But if insects are available, they are the best nutrition source for quail, although obviously in the winter that's a, a, a complication. Yes, insects are a great food supply. Uh, it's certainly important, and that's the only thing that young quail chicks eat in the spring. It's just a matter of availability. When it's cold and snowy out, there's not very many insects available for quail to pick. So if one would like to encourage quail survival by good management, uh, artificial feeding's one option, making sure that adequate habitat's available, another well, I'd prefer it would be done with habitat management to try to mitigate the impacts of winter. Uh, make sure you have habitat that includes food sources that are likely to be available when we have snow cover. And make sure that those food sources are available to quail that's also fairly close to cover. Because even if food is available, quail have to travel very far to seek those food sources. They're very vulnerable to predation at that point in time. Well, there's some research-backed information on the nutritional resources that quail require to make their way through a tough winter weather-wise in Kansas, and Charlie, much obliged. He's a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. With that, our Tuesday edition comes to a close. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.